The next session is all about file systems. And what we have are two different speakers. Um, one is uh, Doug Ocherik, thank you, um, from uh, Luster. And uh, he's going to speak for a, a few minutes. He'll take some questions, and then I'll pass the, uh, the microphone over to Tom Talpy from uh, Microsoft, who will talk about SMB3. Um, and with that, uh, bring it over. Great, thank you. All right, check, check. Good. All right, good afternoon. I'm uh, here to talk about Luster and how it uses the InfiniBand network. I'm following on the theme that Paul introduced as a representative of an application, I'm going to be talking about how we use InfiniBand today, give you some kind of idea of what our traffic profile looks like and how we accomplish that, and then end it off by kind of going to our wish list of what we would like to get out of the fabrics going forward. And I'm not saying that this doesn't exist today, I'm saying this is what we want, and at some point we'll be looking for it, and so if it doesn't exist today, anybody who can provide it to us will be most greatly appreciated. So just uh, for those who may not be familiar with Luster, um, it's a open source distributed uh, clustered file system used uh, by the majority of the high performance computers out there today. Um, it can be split up or thought of as having three types of nodes. Um, there's the clients that are using the file system that will be running some Luster code. There's the uh, metadata server, which stores the metadata, as you can imagine. And then the object storage servers, where we stripe the data over. Um, all three types of nodes have their own Luster logic that they have to run, but when it comes down to networking, they all converge to the same point, which is at, on the right there, the portal RPC layer. So Luster is RPC-based, you know, request-response. The portal RPC layer does all the RPC processing and then passes requests down to the Luster networking layer, or LNet layer. The LNet block represents that common block of code that's done for all Luster networking, um, whether regardless of what the fabric that we're using is. But the following layer, the LND layer, which is the LNAT network driver, this is the code that's specific to the fabric that we're using at this moment in time. So in the case of OFED, it's the O2 IB LND layer. So O stands for OFED, 2 is the second version of this uh, LND, and IB is InfiniBand and it's, it's an LND. So the LND then talks directly to the OFED driver to do the Presumably, we're using InfiniBand, so to do all of the InfiniBand communication. So just sort of diving a little bit more into this, um, first thing I want to point out is that all of this networking stack that I'm talking about resides in kernel space. So when we're talking to the OFED driver, we are talking directly to the OFED driver in kernel space via function calls. We are not using any other API between us and OFED. We're, we're going direct. Um, so if anybody wants to create a driver for us to use, it will need to be in kernel space today if we're going to be able to use it. We can't go back to user space again, you know, to be able to make these calls. Um, so the other thing this diagram is showing is that if we have multiple interface cards, so if we have an Ethernet NIC and a InfiniBand HCA in the same chassis, we can instantiate both and use two different styles of networks simultaneously. And if we put LNet into forwarding mode, we turn ourselves into what is called an LNet router. And this allows us to actually bridge traffic between different fabric types. So we could have traffic, LNet traffic, moving between uh, an Ethernet network and uh, an InfiniBand network and back and forth. Now, when we're using OFED, we are setting up a uh, reliable connection queue pair today. And we tend to send just small messages directly over that, and then we use RDMA for larger messages, which I'm going to get into in a moment. Now, one more thing that's not in this diagram that I wanted to point out, LNet does its own flow control. We have um, two tunable parameters. One's called credits. The other is called peer credits. Credits is the maximum number of outstanding messages we allow on a given network at any given moment in time. Peer credits is the maximum number of messages to a given peer we allowed at, at any given moment in time. So when Portal RPC passes um, requests down to LNet, LNet has to acquire the credits before it sends the message, or else it just queues it until such a time as it does have credits. So we are self-imposing our own flow control on ourselves. That's not something we're expecting from the network. Although if the network provided it, we would probably use it. So the best way to understand how we do um, our InfiniBand communication is to go through an example. In this example, I'm going through an initiator sending some file data to a, a receiver. So once LNet has received the request from Portal RPC and has acquired the credits, 
and only once it's acquired the credits, it will then send two things to its L&D layer. One is an LNet put header, and the other is a message descriptor pointing to the buffer of the data that we want to send over to the receiver. The L&D layer hangs onto the message descriptor and only sends the, the put header all the way through to the receiver's LNet layer. That layer parses it, says, hey, I'm about to receive uh, a packet, or I'm about to receive a buffer of a certain size, allocates the buffer, sets up a message descriptor, and passes that to its own L&D layer. That L&D layer registers that with OFED and gets back a memory ID. That then gets packaged up into a put acknowledgement message that gets fired back to the initiating L&D. The initiating L&D then matches that to the, uh, to the payload that it's about to deliver, registers that descriptor of that buffer um, with OFED, gets back a memory ID. It now has a remote ID and a local ID, puts those together and makes an RDMA write request to OFED. OFED then does the RDMA operation. And when that's done, both LNETs clean up, let the portal RPC know that everything is done, and we just keep on going. So, Something I just want to point out in terms of our characteristic, there are two kinds of messages here. There are unsolicited small LNET headers that we throw back and forth. And then we have the solicited RDMA operations, which are presumably bigger. So we have both small and I'm going to call them medium-sized messages in this characteristic uh, pattern. The third type of messaging that we do is for a health network. Um, today we use something that's rather not too efficient. Um, every client, Creates, that creates a, a, um, an RC Q pair to a peer will send pings occasionally every so many seconds to see that that peer is alive. Well, if you start to think about you know, tens of thousands of clients and hundreds if not thousands of servers, the packet storm that we're creating with our ping network today is quite high. And some, um, some labs are turning that off because the traffic level is getting too high. Now, unfortunately, that means we can't be too proactive about discovering if a node disappears. Then we have to rely on the MDS coming to the clients and saying, you know, you need to clean up because that server is now gone, and that can take a bit of time. So today our health network isn't great. So what we'd like to do in the future is to try using something called a gossip protocol. Um, I'll let you look this up, but just briefly, it's where one node tells state information to two nodes, and they tell two nodes, and so forth and so on. And so you end up with an order log and you know, fault dis distribution latency amongst all your nodes. So if you get a very large cluster, say even a million nodes, and you've got a latency of, say, 100 milliseconds or less, you can usually discover a missing node in, say, two seconds or so with this kind of a distribution model. So this is something we'd like to move towards in the future. And so on that note, our little wish list of things. Um, right now, as our networks are getting bigger and bigger, um, going with RCQ pairs is going to become more expensive. As there's been talks earlier today talk, you know, talking about this from Mellanox and others. We want to switch to something like a reliable datagram to get away from all of that overhead. Now, some of our characteristics of, of our messaging, specifically our small messaging, is order preservation isn't important to us when we switch to this. We do um, RPC, which is request response. So if things get misordered, you're just misordering requests or re you're misordering responses, that's not going to matter. So we don't need order preservation. The messages, especially those unsolicited ones, are small. They're 1K or less in size. The receivers are guaranteed eager, so we have a pre-allocated pool of buffers to receive these small messages into. And the worst case, we might have to allocate memory, but generally speaking, we're trying to take messages off the wire as fast as the CPU is capable. So we're, not, we're trying to reduce any kind of a pushback on the receiving side. On the sending side, as I mentioned earlier, we in incorporate our own flow control through credits and peer credits. So we're not trying to flood the network. So between the behavior of the receivers and the senders, we like to think we're good citizens of the fabric. And in return, what we would like to get from the fabric is a guarantee that Datagrams will only be dropped on transmission failures, not on congestion. We don't mind delays, but we can't have dropped messages because resends are a big hit as your file system gets bigger and bigger. Um, in terms of RMA, we need to support both put and get semantics. Um, and because of that example I showed earlier, we pre-tell the receiver how big of a buffer he needs to receive the packet or to receive the RMA operation. So we have a guaranteed um, buffer, the right size, to receive our RMA operation. So again, we're trying not to let any you know, pressure come back onto the network fabric. Our RMA operations are a reasonable size. They're between 1K and 1 megabyte. So we, we tend to try to slice up 1 megabyte into multiple RMA operations. So we're not dealing with very large 
RMA operations. We're trying to keep them small so that we're not overwhelming the, the fabric. And then for those go that gossip protocol for our, our health network, we would really, really like from the fabric the ability to send high priority messages. So these are ones that'll jump ahead of the queue in front of anything else that's going on, even in, in switches. Such that if we could get a guaranteed latency out of these high priority messages of say 100 milliseconds or less, that would really work well in making the uh, gossip protocol very responsive to um, detecting state changes. So if, I mean, these three areas, if you look at them, it's almost like I'm describing a service level agreement that if we adhere to this, then we get back a certain performance from the network. And I don't know if such a thing could be built, but that's kind of what I'm almost describing, is that, you know, with this characteristic profile, can we get back this kind of behavior from the network? And that's kind of the direction that we're, we're heading in with LNAT. Any questions? Wow. Oh. Howard. Go oh, back up to this last slide. Sure. So in the board, like the, the max size of the RMA, how many outstanding RMA requests do you have, like, for puts and come back to put data? In other words, how many of these registrations might you have active at one time? That depends on how threaded you're letting LNET be. There are tuning parameters as to how many outstanding RPC requests you will allow, which is your concurrency basically from a given node. If you, you know, turn that up to say 16, you could have up to 16 outstanding RMA requests on a lot of data movements. But that is, that is a parameter controlled by the system and something that they can manage. I forget what our default is, but... Um, Yes, that's the one. Bob? So uh, we have a problem. So certain messages that aren't replayable, I think is what you say. So oh. like lock revocations. So what happens is, is you know, send out a lock revocation, it'll get dropped uh, because we're breaking our seat. Uh, and then the node will get evicted. Sign of eviction, yes. And Sometimes it's, there wouldn't be dirty pages on the node, but other times there would. And this issue around RC, I mean, it looks like there's really no good way to deal with this other than making the reliable connection reliable, right? Um, I mean, you have other input. Uh, I mean, so basically what the problem we run into is that there's this very short period of time that Infiniband thinks is short, right, or a long time, right? So on the order of 30 seconds. But from the system side, you know, we might we might want to take the system down and have it not be connected for like four hours, and we want things to keep trying, right? And so we want enough tunables in place that say, okay, well, <coughs> something's gone bad. We want everybody to sort of idle out and stop and go fix the machine, and then. Uh, come back and so you know TCP keep trying or you know so there's a lot of different network protocols that would do that. But so going forward, that's the kind of thing that we want okay. uh, in terms of you know these certain high priority messages that you're talking about. I think the QoS piece I think is definitely something that we, we could deal with today. But the the reliability and the non replayable messages that are an issue for us right now. Yeah, that's what we're hoping with the reliable datagram is that contract that things can be congested but not dropped because that becomes a real problem as you've indicated. So we're hoping that the fabric can help us solve that. But if not, we'll have to come up with something obviously. But this is our wish list if anything. Anyone else up the back there? So the credit mechanism is based on per message or on a... Which thing? They're configured by the, the user. There are some defaults that we have, but they're configured by the user. And so think of it, it's just a number that we hold for the network and for each peer. And we decrement it by one, we put a message out. And when that we get notification that the message transmission is complete, we add a credit. When it hits zero, we start queuing. And then the number goes into the negatives, actually, to tell you what your queue depth is. And so as credits come back, we start sending stuff straight out of the queue back out again. Yep. 
Do they talk to each other as well? Not directly, no. No, I mean, there's other features that are coming up that will move things between them, but they don't, no, not directly, so, no. Anything else? Okay. I, on your diagram where you showed the RDMA write, if you go back to that, how does the receiver know when he's got the information? Oh, I didn't finish it off, but after the RDMA is done, OFAD will get, tell you of a completion. So it must be RDMA write with immediate then? Yes, yes, sorry, yes. I should have put that there. Yeah, you're right. And so we get immediate notification, and then we push up the notifications to LNAT, who then interact with the RPC layer to let them know either the send completed or here's the data that was sent to you. Do whatever you need to do with it as a file system. Right, okay. One comment that came up frequently this morning was that the amount of immediate data is too small. What's your contribution to that? Do you use it for anything? The right with immediate gives you 32 bits, whether you need them all or not. Yeah, um, no, we haven't had a problem ourselves with it being too small. What do you use that for? I don't even think we are, <laughs> to be honest with you. I'd have to double check the code because there's there are, is the odd weird code path, but in general, most of it follows this pattern, and to my knowledge, we're not. Howard? I mean, having done this many, many millions of times, it seems like it's easy if you know you're only going to have a few number of outstanding requests like this because you can just sit back and put back uh, a number you want for the uh, for the sender put into the immediate data part. Sure. But like what the API people want is something where all, they can stick like the pointer to the request. Right. The API request. So you don't have to look up and send because we don't know how many API receives might get posted. Sure. No, I'm surprised they don't need the information at all. Well today, but I mean things may change. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I'll pass it on.